Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Washington Outsider, and it's a series specifically focused on Libya's future. My name is Irina Zuckerman. I'm the Editor-in-Chief, and with us today to discuss the upcoming hmm, uh, Berlin Conference uh, on July 1st and the events surrounding it are uh, Mario Shahade, a uh, yeah. journalist from, uh, from uh, Germany, and Scott Morgan, uh, an independent analyst from the United States uh, whose focus is on African security issues. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My, I would like you to, to, to start uh, with discussing the context of the conference being arranged, the expectations around it, and your recent experiences in Brussels. Uh, then I'll give the floor to Scott and uh, that will follow by a Q and A sec session, a, dis a discussion with both of you about uh, what's going on, what to expect, what not to expect, and uh, what needs to be understood about the the situation in Libya and around Libya. Uh, hello, thank you for uh, for hosting me, Reina, my friend. And uh, thank you so much. Would be glad to talk about Libya. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, hello to Scott. It's a pleasure meeting him. Likewise, pleasure meeting you as well. Thank you so much. And uh, Maya, you can you 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 can start uh, with giving a, a a brief context about the conference being organized. What are the expectations? What's happening in Brussels? What are the preliminary agreements? And how should we understand these uh, diplomatic developments on the European end? If we want to talk about Libya and uh, North Africa in general, and Africa in general, you know the uh, aims now for Russia, China. Um, the US, Europe is going to Africa, all the eyes on Africa. Now, this is for a primer info, and um, I guess Scott would be uh, in the same line uh, for Africa. In Libya case, the latest diplomat now in Berlin, uh, we had that discussion today uh, with Mr. Blinken and uh, the other diplomat uh, meeting today in Berlin too. Well, obviously, Berlin one didn't succeed to uh, have the um, the authority not for giving arms to the militias in, in Libya. Berlin the second uh, as well would uh, would enforce the uh, elections in twenty fourth uh, December and uh, would force the uh, outlaws or or let's say the uh, militias which has been sent from Turkey and Russia, uh, especially Wagner forces, which is uh, in Libya, would uh, Scott would be more efficiency and in, in speaking in details for, for security uh, matters. But politically, I guess the uh, conference uh, won't, won't suc succeed to uh, get the um, militias expired from Libya because the uh, issue itself they are talking to uh, a parties. Um, the par these parties are okay. They are official, but um, they have some files. They have some agendas from countries outside Libya, and those countries, especially Russia, is not attending that that conference. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm talking about the diplomat wouldn't succeed if, if the uh, well of the international community to be stable. Nowadays, we have a, a, a case fire in Libya, but this case fire is, less, is just not the light, not the road, not the real way to, to solve the issue because Russia simply won't get out from there. The EU simply uh, for briefly, they are looking for the uh, uh, foreigners the uh, outlaws, foreigners, which is coming from the refugees, which is coming from Africa, especially from Libya. So they are, uh, they want to have this table uh, for the security forces in Libya, not to get those foreigners, those uh, refugees to towards Europe. And brief, 
what we heard from Blinken and what we heard from Mrs. Merkel, what we heard from the uh, uh, from Egypt, for example, they assured uh, to have the election on 24th December. But that election, I guess it's not, uh, how can I say that, but uh, wouldn't succeed simply because um, there's no well from the Russian side and China side. You know, uh, Libya, as you know, you were discussing uh, and the Washington outside there, um, many, many panels, I watched that for you, Irena, about Morocco and Morocco as linked to Libya, also Tunisia. Uh, and that's why uh, Khalifa Haftar did uh, close the border with Algeria because Algeria is, is going through the uh, Polisario and the problem which had occurred with uh, Spain, especially with borders. So we're not going to the real issue. We're talking about a case fire, so a, a calm way to discuss. But the real parties are not discussing, as simple as that. Russia is not attending Berlin 1 and is not attending Berlin 2. Now, there's a light just for giving the, the Libyan government, which is, uh, I guess, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, Siraj, uh, uh, um, a legacy. They are not, uh, they're not moving freely. Even when they uh, asked Turkey just to get out from uh, from Libya, uh, the Turkish side said, "No, we, are, we we this is our land." As simple as that. And Erdogan keeps saying, and, and the parliament keeps saying that uh, this is a heritage from Ottoman era, and this is our land. Now his his vision for the matter itself, that the gas issue and uh, Cyprus issue and the borders issue is. Um, from his vision, he's always speaking that the Turkey has the right to do whatever that does take to take the right in, in gas and in borders. And this is not right because simply as simple as that, you're not giving the legitimacy to 70% of Haftar's forces. Haftar's forces is now uh, taking the control for 70% of, of the Libyan land. Now, uh, the, the real issue is that not the militias that sent by, by Turkey, because the militias sent by Turkey, uh, they simply can't, can't be, couldn't be expired from, from Libya, because simply they are militias, they are not military, they are not a legal military. So uh, maybe they could be, I, I guess Scott would, would uh, speak about that, uh, uh, but I guess they can be expired. They will be, uh, let's say, relocated in Libya because they are Syrians and uh, they have no land. So where to go? But the Wagner forces, which are controlled by the Russian, uh, they are taking the matter as, as Libya as, as their land. So the real parties are not attending the, the uh, diplomate uh, moves. And uh, this is briefly, I can speak about Libya now. Are you hearing me? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Speaking as an independent security analyst, I'm beginning to look at Libya as not one conflict, but two. Everybody focuses on what has been going on the Mediterranean coast with the fighting between General Haftar's forces and the GNA, but very little mention is actually made towards the southern provinces of Libya. We know that several militia groups and militant groups from Chad, from Burkina Faso, from Niger, from Mali, are using the southern provinces as base of operations. You know, they store weapons there, they train fighters there, actually able to keep them away from the French and US forces that have been operating in for the last few years in both out of both Mali and Niger. That is an issue. We've seen what happened recently with the Chad, with the Chadian attack, attempt to overthrow the government, resulting in the death of President Debe. That came from southern Libya. 
some of the Sunnis fighters, for, which are former Janjaweed, who have been repatriated home back to Darfur. We're starting to see reports that they're returning to their old bad habits. That could place the young, growing, and potentially vibrant democracy in Sudan in jeopardy, widening the conflict. Meyer has been so spot on about several other things. One other fact thing that should be of interest when we when he talks about where could the Syrians go? The Turks have been, Turkey has let it be known that they are planning to take over some of the security missions in Afghanistan after the US and some of the other NATO forces pull out within the next ninety days. What if Turkey sends some of the Syrian fighters to Afghanistan to provide security there? That will be an interesting security dynamic. Uh, I would like to ask my another question. I mean, a question. Since Russia has been refusing to take part in these talks, you know, they refuse to sit at the table, but yet most people that raise concern about Libya are actually focused more on Wagner than the other groups. So why would it, what is, why would that be a major focus? We know Wagner is also, in recent, in recent years, has also set up a base in the Central African Republic. So it appears that could, it appears that Wagner Maybe losing interest in Libya and looking for other areas to expand their focus in, in Africa. And what the future boats. It's chilling by what we see, but the thing that's really concerning are the issues and problems that are coming down the road that we don't see yet. Well, let me uh, answer for the question for the uh, forces of Erdogan. Uh, Scott asked about them, and this is a very important question. Now, there's a problem uh, in the uh, Erdogan backed forces because their religion and their sectarian as Sunni. And in Afghanistan, they are Shi, and uh, Iran will let the Islamic regime in Iran will won't let them go in, 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 in Afghanistan. And there's a lot of militias for, from Iran. Uh, uh, they are Shia in Afghanistan. Now, this is the real issue and the, the hard matter for Erdogan to send them back to Afghanistan. And in Afghanistan, Turkey has two missions. One of them is um, related to a religion issue between Turkey and Iran, especially with Azerbaijan. Uh, especially when Azerbaijan is um, is having a majority Shia and the uh, uh, forces which has been uh, uh, controlled and uh, supported by Erdogan is Sunni and they are fighting for uh, for uh, a purpose in Libya, which they think that uh, they are uh, uh, succeeding in it. And the second mission for Turkey is uh, with the government of Afghan government. Now, our, our talk is not about Afghanistan, uh, it's about Libya. Why I'm, I'm, uh, I'm stressing about Wagner forces? Because uh, Wagner forces in Russia, uh, especially what happened lately to Mali and Chad and Niger, and they are near Libya, uh, all the issues there and the coups there that happened against the governments is not going through the American one. It's not going the U.S. man. Well, they are going through the well of Russia and China, especially China and Russia are going through Africa and they are having some bases there. Now, the real problem is that the Democrats or let's say the uh, uh, Joe Biden administration, they are focusing to uh, giving the legitimacy to Erdogan backed forces. And this is a this is a real problem uh, since the uh, 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 Turkey is in the NATO and the NATO, uh, you know, in 2011, they entered Libya for, um, for mass destruction. Because in Libya, they did a lot of problems there since 2011. And uh, as I say, the parties, 
which is, uh, by the way, by the way, Libya is an uh, existential problem for Egypt. And we, we must take note of that because the other borders with Chad and Niger and, uh, and uh, 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 Central Africa is not, is not way far from Egypt. Egypt is the, uh, 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 let's say, one of the largest countries in Africa and their existing existential problems with Libya is having with these forces, which is, they are, by the way, they are religiously related to the Muslims Brotherhood. That's why Egypt is going there with the Arab League to Berlin. They came to Berlin here today to talk about the, uh, 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 to talk about first issue for EU is the uh, refugees that are coming from Africa. Second of all, that's the head and fix for the meeting. Second of all, uh, politically, uh, when you're having or held uh, an election, which is, uh, would, would, would be a, a red mark for Erdogan. Now Erdogan is playing a role supported by the US until now. Until now, because the latest uh, meeting between Erdogan and Biden in the uh, uh, NATO meeting was uh, was totally uh, uh, understandable. You know, they didn't uh, 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 they didn't discuss anything. They're just having a high chat. They didn't understand anything. And uh, Putin, I guess, with uh, with his meeting with Biden, I guess he talked about Libya because their vision is to Africa. And Libya is one of the states that is very important to Russia because Russia is depending on gas. And gas is the main issue for Russia. So Wagner forces, uh, now the, the other forces is a problem now. Yes, I, I do agree with Scott. He said that, um, he said, uh, well, very important info that the other forces is, is having the, the problem, but Wagner forces, they are uh, controlled by Russia and Russia, uh, as we all know, and Syria and all the uh, around the globe, they having a control with um, with uh, formal militias, not uh, like not like Erdogan back forces or the Muslims Brotherhood, because the other militias is just like they are poor and they can be controlled and they can be uh, fought and bought by other parties, as simple as that. But the uh, Wagner, they are uh, well informed. They have some infos, and uh, as 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 I know from Libya now uh, inside the land, uh, some uh, some gas, uh, let's say petroleum, they are controlling that. They're not uh, inside the cities. They are around the gas, petroleum things, and they are, they are around the borders. And I guess Russia. Now is having a problem with the EU. That's why the meetings, the hidden meetings, was uh, for the refugees, especially in Germany. In September, there's an election, and uh, Mrs. Merkel wouldn't be there. And there's a lot, um, there's a lot of uh, infos and some news that uh, the government will not be hidden by the CDU, which is the Christian Democratic Union anymore. So uh, there will be a Green Party, and the Green Party is. Um, is having, uh, let's say, not a good relationship with Putin and Russia, but they have a stable relationship with them because they are leftists at the end. That's why uh, Europe is, uh, and, and yesterday, Mrs. Merkel have signed, uh, uh, um, let's say, a technological and, and the green policy, and that's becoming an internationally, but they are overcoming the problem, which is on the land, the facts on the land the real fact on the land. So there's an issue can be solved. Uh, there's, there will be, should be, not will be, there should be an international will to expile the, uh, the militias. By that, the election wouldn't be verified because with the militias and with arming them by the parties, wouldn't be an election, a fair election or let's say a, a real uh, government that can be controlled because right now the, the government is just controlling five states in Libya out of 13 states. So have, Khalifa Haftar has some states in control and the parliament itself, which is uh, headed formally by Aqila Saleh, 
and uh, uh, Egypt is, is looking for that, especially uh, Libya is like, uh, is like the Yemeni issue because, uh, because you can enter and out in any time. You know, the Muslims Brotherhood, even ISIS, and, and uh, we're talking now in Iraq, they're talking about uh, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda forces. Comparing the, the current situation in Libya to what's going on in Yemen is almost is almost too perfect. You know, some in some cases we even see some of the same actors at play. Well, with the exception, you know, we don't see a large Russian presence in Yemen, but we do have a Saudi presence. You know, but the concept is, you know, because there's some people in Washington that have been hyper focused on the presence of the UAE in Libya. You know, because as we know, the UAE is coming on the Security Council. The UAE has been very, has been very vocal and has stood and supported General after several times when, when it was necessary. You know, because you know, to some people, you know, that's a point of criticism because they figure. Oh, the UAE is, you know, supporting the Saudi effort and committing atrocities in Yemen. Therefore, they must, they must, they must be doing the same thing in Libya. Is there any evidence of that in Libya? I have not seen it yet, but, you know, so in the civil war, all such atrocities were some, you know, whether it's deliberate or not, we never know. But, you know, we, but right now the State Department, you know, we seem to be it seems to be more focused on the elections because actually yet with 24 hours ago, the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli released results of a poll conducted by the Agency for International Development. These numbers say 60% of the Libyans that they surveyed, they plan to vote in the December elections. Although 70% are actually optimistic about the future of Libya. Which probably tells me that these the people that voted that are optimistic are not paying attention to the international media, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But the one thing that stands stood out to me the most, my are two thirds of those that they survey do not want the December elections delayed. That is the most important piece that came out of this poll. And very few people and uh, analysts or pundits are actually talking about it. But that's the most important thing. These are people saying we want this mess over. Get get the foreign get the foreign them fighters and militias out of here. Let us restabilize the country, and then we can rejoin the international community. Uh, interesting points from uh, both speakers. I will actually be delving in depth in, in, to a lot of this. I wanted to ask Meyer, uh, you mentioned earlier Hafter's closing, closure of the borders with Algeria. It's interesting, Germany actually uh, gave Algeria an opportunity to propose this initiative and Morocco ultimately did not respond initially to the German invitation. Can you comment on what's going on why did Germany handle the situation this way? Why is Morocco um, somewhat being somewhat sidelined, given that it's a uh, the issue directly affecting its own security and economic interests? In Germany, there's uh, there's two claims. One of them is for the internet, internal uh, German community, and the other is related to the international uh, relationship. Uh, the internal uh, issue, because, uh, you know, the latest issue between Morocco and Germany, uh, the diplomat, the both betrayal uh, relationship was uh, having a, a problem. Uh, since the Morocco said uh, or claimed that Germany is supporting uh, some institutes, they are against the will of Moroccan uh, uh, kingdom. And uh, uh, Mrs. Germany, Miss, Mrs. Merkel, especially uh, the ruling party in Germany, uh, they feel that uh, they having a problem with the far right uh, wings, which is the party of AfD, Alternative for Germany. 
and uh, the alternative for Germany, they are supporting the uh, uh, they are supporting the Moroccan Kingdom, and the, uh, 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 the Germany itself, the official, they didn't support the move of uh, former President Trump uh, um, legal uh, uh, by by issuing that the Moroccan Sahara is for the M Moroccan Kingdom. Uh, so generally, they are trying to get out of this problem, uh, not for supporting the Polisario, but not for having that agree with Trump. This is the idea. I'm against Trump. So anything against him, I will, I will be with him. That's why the European countries, uh, they welcome Biden, uh, uh, let's say, vision on the, on the issue. Until now, the US, they didn't even give a... a let's say, uh, any comment to the uh, Trump uh, administration job in Morocco. This is the idea. But uh, for Algeria, Algeria, uh, Algeria, they want um, a credit in their policy and in the, 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 the election for their president from the EU. Because Algeria, you know, it's the same issue with Libya. You have refugee also from Algeria. Now, this is the, the main issue, but from Algeria, you can't control them. In Libya, you have the international community presence there, especially Turkey, which is uh, from the NATO forces. So that's why the, the uh, opening the, the borders that can't no, make noisy for Algeria, because Algeria is like, is like Erdogan, is like uh, giving uh, a warrant to Europe that if you don't do our economic uh, uh, matters, we will be uh, like opening, freely opening the borders for the refugees. This is the main issue. So uh, there's no real solution because there's no real talk with the real parties. You know, you're talking with the diplomat and the diplomat, they don't have the fact. Um, Scott mentioned for, for uh, 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 a good point, which is uh, he asked about the uh, election. Now, yes, 70% of the people of the polls, I, I, I guess they didn't uh, uh, want the, the, this election because there's a military. Now, that's why I, I told you in the brief in the first uh, earlier, I told you that uh, the, the militias can't go out, can't expire. Turkey can't use their militias in, in Afghanistan due to the religious issue with Afghanistan, sectarian uh, issues with, with Shia and Sunni. This is uh, uh, first First of all. Second of all, they want to nationalize them inside Libya because Erdogan feels like uh, when we have a chaos there in Libya, I can have my, my vision there, especially with Egypt. That's why he's he wants to come down with uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Egypt, and he wants uh, his relation back because he failed that uh, uh, he paid a price inside Libya by sending a militias. By the way, the militias, they're having a money uh, and, and arms from uh, Turkey. And uh, uh, by the way, one of the president, Turkish president, he was killed there in Libya. So this is a big price for Erdogan internally in Turkey. I'm speaking internally in Turkey. So uh, he, he felt like um, I paid a, a big price in Libya. So I have to be there. And the NATO want to use him. This is the main issue. Mm -hmm. But right now, there's nothing uh, uh, clear about uh, the presence of Turkey and NATO in Libya. Because as Scott says, the uh, uh, US embassy and, and, and Tripoli, they sent missiles, yes. But there's no real fact. Like the presence of the US in Yemen was way far more, 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 more effective in Yemen, more than Libya. And Libya, uh, as I told you, the Russian have the real map there in Libya by Wagner forces. So now, now I'm going to turn to Scott to follow up on some questions that he said. Yeah. Um, again, coming back to the point about the, pol about the Poles and Libyans wanting foreign groups out of there. The question is, is it, does the current U.S. administration see it as in its interest to have those foreign militias out of there? On the one hand, uh, the U.S. did 
slap some sanctions on some Russian and Turkish uh, officials for various things in Russians due to you know you, uh, Ukraine to Navalny, uh, various internal matters in Turkey regarding the purchase of S-400s uh, from, from Russia. They limited it, from, excluded it from the participation in the F-35 program, continuing the Trump policy, uh, actually. But on the other hand, we are seeing the US um, allowing Russia to proceed with the Nord Stream, Nord Stream uh, 2 in Europe um, without uh, and actually lifting sanctions on the energy uh, aspect of it. And we are seeing um, essentially a sort of semi-reconciliation with Turkey on other fronts. There's been a discussion about selling an F-35 to Turkey, even if they're not fully participating in the program. Um, that's at the very least being negotiated and on the table, even if um, they're not completely a part of it. So it seems like the administration seems to be willing to do some of our business with both Russia and Turkey. And what does it say about about um, Biden's interest in, in Libya? What, what kind of future do they entail? Do they see it as essentially balancing different interests and keeping US out and essentially seeing Russia and Turkey as stabilizing the country against some other potential chaotic forces. What, 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 what exactly is Biden's policy? What, what are they hoping to see? I, it's unclear to me from 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 developments and communications. What's what's the outcome that they're pursuing? Well, you know that is a great question, but we do we do know that on three different occasions since Secretary Blinken has assumed his post that the U.S. has called for all foreign fighters to leave Libya, you know. I mean, that's been done on three separate occasions, you know, and we're going from late January to now June. So in the first six months of the years of this year, the U.S. has done that three times. I mean, the Secretary of State has. We know that the head of AFRICOM has visited the embassy recently to get a firsthand assessment on the, to determine how what uh, from a military point of view the U.S. can do to help stabilize, because right now I mean, could Russia could could the U.S. see Russia as a stabilizing force? I don't see that because whenever there's a cyber hack or anything else, I mean, the first thing is to say people will say is oh, is those damn evil Russians doing this again? Uh, as for as for Turkey, you know, their its actions in Syria have caused a great deal of angst among some um, people in Congress here. Same with Cyprus. In the same way that they also seemingly antagonize Greece, which is let it be known also that they support the actions of Ke of General Haftar in Egypt, which very few people seem to pay attention to. But it seems uh, it almost seems that regardless of the last few administrations, whenever there's a whenever there's a situation like this, you know, we've seen this in other parts of Africa, even uh, Africa as well. We've seen that the US policy has been if they hold elections, it will solve all issues. <laughs> that argument is flawed. I mean and and it has not worked well because, uh, and, you know, we've seen it in several other places, you know, I mean, case in point, look at Ethiopia right now. But I want to go back for a second to some of Mayor's comments about Algeria and add some depth to them. Within the last two weeks, the president of Algeria has come out and has accused General Hafter of being a mercenary. That is not going to bode well for any future talks within within Libya, especially if Algeria is a participant, as many people want them to do. It. And there's a lot of people, and I also know other people that want to see Algeria take a grip, play a greater role in the situation of Mali. But there is also an, another interesting caveat that very few people picked up on when it occurred. 
when Turkey decided to support the GNA in Tripoli. They were looking for logistics bases in the region. They reached out to both Tunisia and they reached out to Algeria. Granted, this when they reached out to Algeria, it was just before the election of the current president. The Algerians at that time said no to hosting a logistics base for the Turks. And now, and also we've seen the, the comments of the from President Tussain saying, you know, saying that he regrets not intervening in Libya to support to, to support stabilization when Turkey asked him to. Why would he make such a statement? You know, who is he trying to placate? Is he trying to do it so certain certain other countries actually pony up military and aid because the Algerian economy still continues to struggle? You know, they're having issues with tensions. You know, with the as you, both of you have pointed out, they're still having issues with Morocco regarding the actions of the Polisario. So basically, that's one of the things that the, sometimes the, Algerian, the Algerians may be doing this just so someone throws them a, a lifeline of a, a multi-million dollar loan. But what, but what is the end game that, from the U.S. perspective? You know, basically, a, a stable... Of, should be a stable Libya, one which has control over the refugee issues, preferably have ministers within the government that are not under indictment from Europol for human trafficking, but that's that's another conversation that should be held, but a few people won't because they prefer stability. And I put that on us on the United Nations, on the UN. And you know, this is the time, you know, the closer that the Libyans could, can get to actually having elections and stabilizing their own country, then it's time for the UN and others to step back and let them do it and, uh, and observe. Like what they did at successfully in the DRC elections in 2011, which they then subsequently screwed up in 2016. Uh, excellent point. And to just follow up quickly, you mentioning Mali, one of the actors that is pushing Algeria's role in Mali is none other than France. Now, France also has strong relations with Morocco, but views Algeria as essentially its territory. Morocco is turning towards the U.S. after the Trump uh, recognition of the uh, uh, of its sovereignty over Sahara. Biden did not revoke that recognition officially, even though there are questions on whether or not he's, and to what extent he's going to um, enforce that. But France seems to be, you know, wishing for a stronger Algerian role, especially if Morocco is not going to be uh, playing ball. But that raises questions about France, France's interest in, in Libya, considering what is happening with, with Algeria and the role Algeria could be uh, playing there. And, uh, you know, from Morocco's perspective, given that France and Germany have sort of a competition for resources in that general area, that would be a good opportunity to play off one against the other. But I don't, I personally don't see that actually happening. I, um, uh, I see surprisingly, despite uh, these inter European Union Clash, internal clash of interest that uh, some the Germany and France are still uh, seeing Algeria kind of as a as a as a key player and are almost willing to pursue it to the uh, to the exclusion of Morocco um, and I, I kind of find it a little bit surprising personal I, I would think that there'd be more of a kind of uh, of attention over this issue what, what, what do you think of that? Is that for me or my art? Because I would say that I would say that looking at this from also someone who's also worked on the Mali issue is that you know the removal of Colonel Gaddafi was a factor in the current instability in Mali and has been since 2012. There's no other way to get around it. There were sent there were. Uh, segments in the Malian population, specifically the Taregs, that whenever they had an issue with the government in Bamako, the person they reached out to to be a mediator was Colonel Gaddafi. When we removed him, 
when the West removed him back in 2011, that opened up the window for the issues in Mali. I mean, there's no other way to get around it. So, and I told, and I have, as I've told people, you you fix the Mali issue by fixing Libya. You find, and that way, the Malians can actually find, you know, specifically the Tariqs or some of the other tribes can find a mediator that they can actually to, go to. Because you know, I because I I've actually have heard from people on the ground that there is a growing resentment towards the French presence in Mali. I mean, in some cases, they actually prefer the United States to be there. I've actually heard that in several other places where the French have a heavy presence in Africa. Unfortunately, Algeria is not one of those countries. But, you know, it's almost like they're back to playing a version of the great game that Russia and Great Britain played in Asia back in the, you know, just before the onset of the First World War and almost back to the colonial days where France and England were actually jousting for position in Africa. It's almost like people in Whitehall and in the Shams of Aziza have gotten back to that mindset. But instead of being in Brussels and Paris, it's Paris and Br it's Paris and Berlin against the rest of Europe. Yeah, I, I find that very very curious. I do agree. I, I do agree with uh, with Scott that the election, uh, uh, the perfect solution for them is the election is totally fraud. I do I do uh, agree with Scott, and I do agree with Scott that the uh, Libyan issue is uh, connected to Mali, Niger, and Chad the uh, countries who's, uh, which is uh, uh, near, near Libya. So we have to solve that issues. Now, France have, uh, have some, uh, uh, let's say, they are weak in that country in these days. After uh, uh, removing uh, Gaddafi, all the issues were turned around uh, in front of the table, let's say, up, uh, above the table. So uh, I do agree with Scott. That uh, uh, that the uh, perfect solution, which they uh, emphasize that the election should be on 24th of December. Now there's a real issue. That's what what I said uh, earlier. That the real parties they are not uh, uh, they are not attending any conference and they are not attending any talk. Um, uh, by the way, your question is is very important for what's the U.S. Um, interest from uh, having a deal with that and that. Now, the former administration of Mr. Trump was um, was very clear in the issues. So when was he having uh, a, 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 an issue with, uh, with the Muslims Brotherhood and uh, Iran, he was very clear in um, putting his vision. This administration is trying to uh, say, no, I'm not Trump, but uh, they have no solution. You know, again, I'm against Trump, but uh, I have no solution. Mm -hmm. the, having no solution, this is the real problem. You know, there's no clear vision, no clear map. And again, uh, I have to have a, a relation with Turkey because there's some interest with Turkey inside these countries. Okay, I have a relationship to stabilize Egypt and uh, the other parties like Saudi Arabia and UAE, who they are, you know, they, uh, they are going through Libya and some, uh, some other countries. And I'm having a problem with Algeria uh, so for, for the refugees problem, and they're having a, a problems with Morocco. All these issues, the administration is not clear about. Okay, they want to stabilize. Okay, what's the solution? Now, if, 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 if you look at Blinken's uh, tweets and statements and uh, talks, we want a democracy. We are together. We are fighting together. This is just a creep, you know? Uh, I, I, I'm listening to nothing, nothing. There's no solution, you know? No clear message, no clear statement. I'm, I'm, uh, we, mu we must say that um, the, the forces, the militias in Libya, there's no international will to expel them. As simple as that, you know? And uh, the, 
the the latest uh, Putin and Biden meeting, I think it's very important, uh, not only for uh, Afghanistan and Syria and uh, the whole region. It's very important for for uh, for Africa because I've heard about uh, some news. Uh, I'm not sure about it, but I've heard that Putin has given the U.S. three to six months to uh, get out from uh, 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 Syria and, and Libya. That's what I hear, but I'm not sure about that, uh, that news. But my question is for Scott, uh, that, does the gas issue as the real matter or there's a, a vision for Russia and China in Libya and in Africa in general, especially Libya is, is one of the borders in Africa? This is this question is very important, I think. Oh, it is. It is a very important question. By some, but if you go by watching the press conferences from the White House or even the State Department, sometimes getting a straight answer from this administration is like pulling hen's teeth. As you know, um, <laughs> but as you know, um. You know, the oil and gas issue has been, is an important issue because, you know, every, even during all these years of crisis and fighting and like that, the, one, the oil, national oil company has been one of the few institutions in Libya that has actually been able to operate with little or no interruption. The, one of the other institutions happens to be the Central Bank of Libya. But as you know, you I mean, if I would actually buy that, but considering that this administration is so focused on green energy, on green and renewable energies, that I actually would would be saying, you know, you know, maybe I'm actually surprised you're not going in and offering companies like we will give you X amount of dollars, you know, for you to build solar solar plants. Or we will provide you X amount of money, you know, so you can build wind windmills along this, you know, along the Mediterranean coast. I mean, those are the t types of things that I would actually expect to hear from this administration, instead of just big, vague, generic statements like "we want the foreign forces out." You know, we support a dialogue, but they don't go into the. They haven't really gone into the details about what type of support the U.S. will actually offer. You know, like when, if the, after the elections, when when they're supposed to start trade, you know, when they're supposed to merge the GNA, LNA, and the GNA armies, you know, what type of training are they going to offer the Libyan military? Those are things you would expect to be hearing come out of this administration, but we're not. You know, it's almost to the point. You know, you you, you don't you're not even getting any decent answers from when actually going and testifying in front of Congress. Because, you know, the head, you know, you know, this is, you know, you know, this is budget season here in Washington, so we should actually so things like this, how we're gonna help Libya should be front and center. But very few people are talking about it. You know, the the head of the you know, once a year the man is coming to Washington. Come. Even though about the during the time of the transition, he didn't make a stop in Libya to get a first hand assessment. Was a follow up ever done? Not really. No, because some of the statements, you know, sometimes are purposely vague, but you people are wondering what exactly is our commitment? Besides having free and fair elections in Libya, a return to normalcy and a removal of foreign fighters. It seems like after that the conversation get goes into the weeds. Sometimes you actually wonder if it's actually done deliberately so people will actually lose interest. Okay. So uh, speaking about security in, in, in Libya, what's, Scott, what's your idea about, about the uh, uh, Russian interest in Libya? And how can they, uh, um, but this question is from, how can they uh, roll the, the model in, in, in Libya as for Russia? 
And as you know, uh, you know, basically, if they're doing this under contract, you know, we have, you know, it has to be de determined how long the contract is for. Because I have heard virtually nothing about what about whether or not the government in Benghazi has actually renewed its contractual obligations to retain the services of Wagner. We don't know if that's been renewed or not. Because those are the type of things that I would look for. Because I actually have a habit of reading TASS and other Russian online sites because things like that, they would hype to the moon. I mean, almost to the point with some of their propaganda that they've been using about their operations in the Central African Republic, even to the point of making movies. But when it comes to Libya, they're very, very quiet about this. And generally, when Russians are quiet about something, they're doing something. Uh, okay. So my, so my question to Maria now is regarding Egypt and the Turkey reconciliation and the attempted reconciliation with the GNU, as they now call the new, the, the, uh, the, Tripoli, the Tripoli government. Uh, wh what, what exactly is the outcome of all this? On the one hand, we're hearing rumors that Egypt, Egypt Turkey talks are on the verge of failing. On the other hand, you have um, Egyptian head of uh, intelligence uh, traveling, traveling to Tripoli and appearing to be engaging in very informal um, uh, discussions. Turkey has been given some leeway to operate in Libya. What are the limitations of these attempted reconciliations and to what end, given the fact that uh, it doesn't really change anything, it doesn't change, is it an attempt to uh, recoup so, some ground given that Turkey is not going anywhere to uh, to just uh, essentially wait out the Biden administration without going into some full-scale full confrontation. What's the purpose of these um, moves given that no none of the real issues have been solved and are not going to be, and they're not solvable? Actually, Egypt, uh, they have they are very clear. They told Turkey that uh, restoring relationship with Ankara, is, uh, it needs a time. It's not about Libya issue. There's a lot of issues uh, inside the Mediterranean Sea and the the other uh, uh, Egyptian agreement with uh, Italy, Greece, and, and uh, France. So it needs a lot of time. So these moves are just maybe rearranging the uh, lines in, in Libya. You know, when Turkey uh, went to, uh, uh, to, to Sert and Jaffa, and both, uh, both uh, cities and both lines are very important for the uh, security and internal security in Egypt. That's why Egypt wants, wants primarily wants to draw these lines for their interests with Turkey, but the reconciliation or, or having a good relationship with Turkey, I think it's, it, it needs a lot of time and it's need, it needs a lot of effort, especially from Turkey, because Turkey, um, since 2012, until now, they are not, uh, 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 they are not considering that uh, uh, President al-Sisi in Egypt and the uh, formerly government is a, is a, is a legitimate, that's why the vision is like broken, you know, you have to build it from zero. But Egypt, they want to draw lines, especially in Libya, because Libya is the nearest border and Jeffra al Sir, they are very important uh, cities for Egypt, for security, national security in Egypt. So Egypt is, is drawing some lines to save itself from, uh, uh, from having uh, problems, especially from the Libyan side. And especially that Egypt is now having a talk with the Ethiopian and the Nile issue. And this is uh, very important for Egypt. So they have two, um, mm -hmm. let's say two roads and those roads are very hard. You know, uh, even the US is looking for, for uh, uh, Ethiopian elections now is, 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 is in Ethiopia. And this is connected to the national security in Egypt. And both uh, problems, they have to discuss it by intelligence forces. But until now, they have no agreements. It's just a move for drawing lines, for saving this national security for Egypt. But uh, for politics, I guess it, it, it needs a lot of time. 
The U.S., as I told you, there's no clear vision. Until now, the administration, they have no clear vision about uh, how to deal with Egypt. Until now, you know, the U.S. didn't draw anything with Egypt. And, you know, formally, this is, by the way, you, you, you ask a, a good question. The former administration of Obama, the real issue, because they look to uh, Egypt, as you know, as, as, as a recycle ban, and we can remove it. And this is the real issue because Egypt is a regional state. It's not, it's not a small country. It's a big country and it's stable, not for the international economics, uh, let's say trading uh, for, for the uh, Nile and, and the uh, uh, waters. It's because uh, the, the places of Egypt, in the Islamic world and in the Arab world and in Africa and in the Mediterranean. That's why Egypt is very important. It's not, for example, it's not like for Turkey. You know, uh, Egypt has a, a good relationship with the Arab countries, you know. Uh, so Egypt is very important. So Obama was playing like, um, a, a playing a, a hard and strange uh, uh, decision to remove Egypt from the uh, vision and the map. That's why now the reconciliation between Egypt and the US is very important because the, the clearance for these issues in Libya and Mali and the, the, the Ethiopian uh, problem is connected to Egypt. If Egypt is not stable, they won't be stable. As simple as that. This is my humble opinion about the issue. So the US is not having a clear, clear relationship with Cairo that's why there's a lot of problems. It's not uh, it's not solved yet, and the as as Scott says, um, Mr. Blinken, it's not clear. Okay, we need stability, but in which case and in, in, in which way? You know, he's not he's not clear. You know, as simple as that. It's not clear. The uh, U.S. administration is not clear about these issues and how can they support the stability? You know. Or when we're going to Libya, you know, even the GNA, they're having a small support for, for the GNA. They're having a small support for Turkey, a small indirect support for Haftar. And at the end, the whole forces is, is equal, you know, even if we say Haftar having a, 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 a lot of lands, but he still doesn't have the capital. And this is the real issue. So there's, you know, the war, the case fire, it's very easy, but to restore calm and to restore stability is very hard. And you have to uh, 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 consider one party to rule the country. And there's a lot of parties in, 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 in Libya. I, I don't know if, if Scott do agree with me about this these points I mentioned. I agree because in, in my view, one of the most important relationships that the United States has or should have in the Middle East is a relationship with Cairo. And you know and you know, um I think the you know, the way that we actually treated former President Mubarak opened a lot of eyes to some people in the Middle East staining. We could trust the United States in the past, but can we trust it now? I mean that green assault was ingrained in people by the way that they were, the Obama administration treated treated former President Mubarak. Besides General El Sisi for his the way he's for the way he's governed, but he is that's important. Uh, he rules one of the most important pieces of real estate anywhere in the world. You know, you have the stability in Libya to his immediate west. He has problems to his south, you know. You know, he also has, people forget, you know, he also has an insurgency in the Sinai that very few people talk about, which is inspired by the Muslim Brotherhood. And we all know that the Egyptian leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood, guess where they're staying? They're hiding in Turkey. So that's, so whatever... So Al Sisi has to walk a fine line, not of his choosing, but he's actually been mastering it pretty well. 
but almost it's almost to the point right now if you want if we want clarity about any u.s policy position regarding libya or any any place else in africa i'm not i'm actually not paying attention to the state department i'm actually paying attention to what congress says you know, as you, as they decide, you know, as they approve, you know, like middle military sales to countries in certain Africa, which where do congressional delegations go to visit to, to get a first hand look in the on the situations on the ground? You know, it's to the point where most people actually trust Congress more to address these situations than the White House. So that's go ahead. Go ahead. I mean. Yeah, so that that's that's one thing I'm also going to focus on to see and to see that and and there's another thing that Meyer may be interested in is that around the world, you know, specifically in you know in Arabia and the Horn of Africa and in Niger, the Biden administration is reducing the usage of UAVs. So we're actually counting our own. And we're actually tying our own hands behind our back, gathering intel and doing for and protection of friendly forces if necessary. So, I mean, you know, there has been some criticism about how the U.S. has used UAV policies. And another thing is, is that the ambush of the uh, Green Berets in Niger, that also is having an impact on how and what policies the U.S. will actually ha take, not just in Libya, but in other parts of Africa as well. So those are two factors that also weigh into whatever decisions or indecisions this administration is making. You know, I was actually in uh, in Libya, in Benghazi, in October 2020. And uh, the sense that I got from being there was that everyone was tired of foreigners, and particularly they were and they were tired of Russians as, as much as they were tired of the Turkish presence and involvement. Now, the curious thing to me is that there's no shortage of money to go around. If there was, if if Libya, if the Haftar forces were interested in acquiring some sort of supplementary defense contingent from somewhere other than Russia, there's no shortage of mercenaries, skilled mercenaries around the world who would be, um, including Western trained mercenaries who could be capable of doing the job. There seems to be some political consideration that makes it impossible to cut ties with the Russian militias completely. Either that or there is some sort of a pressure or a deal that goes beyond security and uh, arrangements that implicate some other party that uh, that that uh, we are not aware of who could that be and what could be this pr pr consideration that makes it uh impossible for Haftar to cut ties with the russians and to find somebody else to f perform the same task well if we're talking wagner you know wagner you know the leader you know the leader of uh and founder of wagner mr prigazan is a close confidant of Vladimir Putin, and they do not go anywhere or do anything without President Putin either knowing about it or appro or approving it. So that's one major factor about Wagner. And second, you know, and there have been allegations as well as so Hafter has used some of the has recruited some of the former Janjaweed fighters from Darfur and some of the militias from Chad. You know, and we've seen what happened as you know. As they have been left, the best word I could probably describe it is unsupervised, because you know some of the Chadians went back and tried to overthrow their government, and let, which led to the, pre the death of former President Debbie. And some of them are actually, you know, the Danish Reed have gone back into Darfur. Granted, both sides in this conflict have used Sudanese and Chadian fighters. Both sides have. And it's amazing that everybody focuses more on half his relationship with Wagner than what the Turk than the Turks taking the Syrians in. And that is just one of the most amazing things I've seen here in Washington. It's almost to the point it's like you know you know, you know, it's up to the point if you raise that Turkey's taking a 
you know, Turkey sent X amount of Syrian fighters in there. And then, and then, and then each reaction, you, you, I get, uh, I've actually had this every person. He's like, yeah, but Wang is there and they signed, as you know, they, you know, they flew Hafter out to that Russian warship in the Med and they signed the paperwork out there, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, you know, both sides do things like that in the Civil War. But, you know, but, but it's just people focus more on what, on Wagner than what everybody else is doing. And if I was another, Militia leader, or whatever. I could do whatever, whatever I want to, and make it look like Wagner did it, and I could get away with it. Hmm. Very interesting point you brought up there. Speaking of which, and speaking of everybody else, and that goes to Meyer, but Scott, you can also weigh in if you wish. Uh, somehow, you know, last year, all, you know, all these articles were coming out about human rights abuses in Libya, about ISIS, about all these. Muslim Brotherhood types emerging and doing all of these things, all of a sudden, uh, everything, you know, Egypt and Turkey attempt to make a reconciliation and all of that coverage comes to an end. Suddenly ISIS disappears, Al-Qaeda uh, disappears, all these foreign forces, even Iran-backed Iraqi uh, militias uh, coming in through, the, through Tunisia they all somehow have gone away somewhere. Where are these groups that were local? I'm not even talking about the Syrians now. I'm talking about the local contingencies who uh, kind of um, were such a security problem for everybody. And all of a sudden, uh, suddenly there's no Muslim Brotherhood. Suddenly there's no ISIS. Suddenly every, everything is okay. And uh, as well as local militias, we're not talking just about foreign militias. We're talking about Misurata. Uh, militias, Tripoli militias that have been having internal issues and have been um, have made al alliances with Erdogan's uh, Erdogan's fighters. Where what happened to all these groups? And Meyer, Scott, you both feel free to weigh in on this one. Well, let me tell you something: the religious forces or the religious militias is is worse than the mafia worse than the nationalists because the religious you know um, uh, you're calling a fighters from all the, around the globe they have no job they have no woman you know and you give them money and a woman and he can do anything for you because his life is like almost zero so if um like Syria, you know, and Yemen and, uh, and uh, Libya and all around the, the globe, especially the forces coming by a sectarian, you know, ideas, like the Iranian forces and the Muslims Brotherhood, which they are supporting some, uh, some uh, agendas for, for the uh, terrorist groups. So they have, uh, uh, they have a land and they are sitting in it. You know, you can't control them because there's no names for them. You know, you give them a, a, a former name and there's the name are not real, so you can't control them. So the militias, which has been supported by Erdogan and sent from Syria and Turkey to, to uh, Libya, they can live peacefully in, in Libya and they will be steady for anything. They will be ready for anything. Uh, Speaking about ISIS, for example, ISIS presence in, 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 in Libya, it's similar to what happened in, in Yemen, especially in the southern Yemen. You know, uh, it's a group supported by the Muslims Brotherhood, but suddenly they go out to the media and said, no, we're not Muslims Brotherhood. We're doing that alone. And we have some, um, some let's say, uh, that said idea about uh, about uh, terrorism, and um, we're fighting again. But you can buy them, you know. They are living in Libya. They can be expelled. That's that's the main point I, I, as I spoke about earlier. That these militias, uh, because they have no nationality and there's no idea, uh, a lot of uh, of of passports and names. So you can decide where to go. So they can go to Afghanistan, Yemen, they move freely because uh, they have something you know, hidden. So they are living in Libya. Speaking about Libya, they are living in Libya, now the militias. And if politically they say that we expel some militias, the militias simply are not out of Libya. 
and they are not in or around Tripoli. They will be living in, in, uh, in, uh, in the houses outside Tripoli, but they are ready for anything. This is, this is my idea about them. So uh, ISIS can uh, uh, formally uh, uh, show off in front of the media suddenly, maybe tomorrow after tomorrow, but they will be like, boof, you know, they are not here. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree, Mayor, because we have a saying here in the United States that the, sometimes the best way to hide is to hide in plain sight. You don't wear, you know, basically as you go about your normal daily routine, but you're not wearing your militia uniform, but you're, you're wearing your normal normal street clothes or tribal garb. So that way you're made, able to move throughout the population when no one the wiser about who you are or who your actual loyalties are to. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And I think it certainly holds true for at least some of the people. But what to me is mystifying is what happened to everyone who was complaining about the Muslim Brotherhood types in the Tripoli government? What, where did those guys go? All the war criminals, all the local, uh, all the local gangs that were employed initially with the U.S. assistance to help fight ISIS and whatever, but later became affiliated with the Erdogan, uh, with the Erdogan militias, but we're local to Libya, they're Libyans, I'm not talking about the Syrians. You know, you've been having all these coverage about human rights violations, abuses, rapes, lootings, did it all stop as soon, the moment Egypt and Turkey decided to sign in a, uh, and Jen used uh, signed an agreement. Um, what is happening in terms of that? Where did all these horrible types that everybody was talking about? What happened to them? Why, why is there no coverage whatsoever about what's going on? Did all these abuses stop? Did all these war criminals disappear? Did all the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, were they all kicked out of the government? Where are they? Let me tell you something, Irena, here. You know, in the past, uh, when the U.S. started by Administration Bush to fight the terrorism issue, like Osama bin Laden and Baghdadi later on, you know, you have that pyramids of political uh, uh, organization. So you know, the, you, you know them by name, and you know them by um, you know them by name, and you know them by by their loyal, as Scott said, by the loyalties. So um, you can fight them. As I told you, when you are hidden and indirect, the the uh, misinfo will be uh, around around the globe. You know, you will be around the globe. For example, I'll give you an example here. The Pakistani intelligence, you know, have some uh, organizations, and they were sending uh, uh, like uh, Muslims, and they teach them that you are a Muslim brotherhood or Shia or having some ideas, uh, sectarian ideas, and they send, to, send them to Europe. You know, last year in Germany and in the intelligence, they said they told us that if you went to the Pakistani intelligence uh, buildings, you won't differ that from the uh, terrorist group because uh, they are having the, the same mentality. Now, uh, it's a good point to say that you have to study them just to enter them and know them, but that's not the way to exclude them. You know, the countries that sub they supported these terrorist groups in the past, because you know Osama bin Laden and you know Al Dawahiri and you know the guys between them and around them. You know, you know their organization and pyramids organization. You know. It's either on Afghanistan or Pakistan, Libya, and, and all around the globe. But right now, the military is, is working like not individually in specific, but in, in small groups, not in the big groups. So you can't know them and you can't know their loyalty. For example, I'll give you an example. In Yemen, they said that uh, the US uh, killed a Rami, which uh, who, who, who's, who was the first al Qaeda the leader in, in southern Yemen. And after two or three months, they said that they uh, detained uh, a big Al-Qaeda guy in southern Yemen. Suddenly, before two to three weeks, he appeared in a video and he said that um, we're back, we're going to back in Al-Qaeda. Now, the 
the government in Yemen, uh, there's a Muslims Brotherhood inside that, so they ease the way to those guys. So these guys are hidden, you know, you don't know their loyalties and they don't know the, the uh, their pyramids organization because they are small groups, you know, they've been used uh, uh, to a lot of forces, not only Erdogan. So if, if you want to check the Libyan terrorist group and the militias, if you want to the small group, you will have a series of groups until you uh, uh, reach the uh, 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 Turkish military. But You're the, having a good series. But those guys, they're still there, they're still active. Why aren't they getting any media coverage? Why did all the coverage of these abuses of all this extreme activity stop? And what happened to Siraj's people, all the Muslim Brotherhood types that everybody was complaining about in the in the Tripoli government? They you know, in Egypt, in Egypt, there's a slogan for the Muslims Brotherhood. They eat a meal with the house owner and they get out with the thief, with the sealer, you know? That's their, that's their appearance, you know? Uh, he can, as, as Scott said, you know, he can wear a jeans and having that uh, uh, plain bill and uh, he would be with no beard, and suddenly you discover that he's inside the these groups, these groups, these terrorist groups. You know, that's why you can't uh, all have all uh, Siraj uh, guys in the government. You know, because they're having an, an own business in Libya, but they are rolling indirectly. So they haven't actually gone anywhere. And the no, 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 no. Make no, sure they that haven't. they haven't gone. Not only have they not gone anywhere, but it seems to me that the current government is basically, you know, puppets, kind of like some of the technocrats in 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 uh, in Tunisia who are equally beholden to Turkey as the Muslim Brotherhood uh, types, but are just willing to play the game and appear secular and religious, but just are as crap. So we are seeing the same picture. Nothing has actually changed. You have the Muslim Brotherhood controlling the government through appearance of people who would be more that Egypt is willing to deal with. Is that is that you know a correct assessment of the situation here? Yes it is. But you also have to remember right now as you know as the Muslim Brotherhood and the other elements, you know, you know, they have the UN backing as the GNA in Tripoli. Mm -hmm. The reason and now, and they're not, and, and with that, if you're following that train of thought, then automatically Hafter, General Hafter, and the all their authorities in Benghazi, they're the bad guys. They're the one trying to disrupt order. The GNA and the Islamist militias and like that, whatever, in Tripoli, they are the ones that are trying to uphold what the international standard of order is. And, and going to... Uh, Myers point, I I will even go with it even further. Is that generally if a person is in the government office, you know, a you know specifically if it's a ministerial position, you know, they have some form of protections where they cannot be prosecuted while in office. So I mean, you look at I mean the best way to describe what I'm trying to say is what happens. Look what's happening to Prime Minister Netanyahu. I should say former Prime Minister Netanyahu right now. Now that you know his party's lost an election, he's leader of the opposition. Now you're seeing his prosecution for grafting corruption move forward now, because he's no longer Prime Minister. They can actually. Have mm -hmm. But we are not seeing we are not seeing the prosecution of this supposedly former uh, GNA Siraj, you know, Muslim Brotherhood activists in fact we, we, the scene even though it's supposed to be a different makeup right now we are seeing the same continuity of us pretending that this is the stabilizing form and you know all these human rights abuses all these allegations from the past few years that we've been hearing it's like nothing happened you know so i'm trying to figure out what, what, what's the what's going on is the lobby have the lobbies become more effective is it because egypt has 
temporarily abandoned this issue to focus on the GRG uh, front in order to be entangled. Why is there this dead uh, silence on these e events from last year and so forth that we're supposedly so horrifying then and suddenly it's as if it never happened? Well, we also must remember that the International Criminal Court also has a preliminary investigation currently ongoing regarding the situation in Libya. So, and heaven forbid for some people to be accused of influencing such an investigation. You know. Right. It's, uh, I just find it very strange that there's suddenly a complete lack of reporting. All these activists who were trying to draw attention to all these things happening, they seem to have gone away and got shut down. So it's almost like there's a media blackout on the events that I see no reason to have stopped completely. Well, that, and they also probably have new crises to write about, you know. Seems like almost daily, I mean, my, my news feeds and Twitter feeds, so I mean, when I look at it daily, almost half the half the information is about Ethiopia, the, it seems, and the other half is about Myanmar. So you know, you know, they have the media has moved on because they have a nice, they have another crisis. You know, it's almost like the principle with the red rubber ball and the dog. You know, if you throw the ball and mm -hmm. such a direction, the dog's going to go chase it. You know, because right now the ball is being thrown; it does not have the word Libya on it. Now that's bringing back to the issue of crisis. Another crisis that uh, went almost, uh, you know went under the radar is the issue of the transportation of weapons uh, from the Mediter through the Mediterranean to Libya on various ships that we knew even last year, France and other countries were willing to, uh, they weren't being stopped, they continued going. So now things have gone even quieter than last year. Now there's even less coverage and this discussion of arms transports to Libya it seems to have stopped. Even the discussion well, of the Syrians being transported there seems to have stopped. Mm -hmm. So have they actually stopped the delivery of weapons or is it still an ongoing issue? Oh, trust me, weapons the weapons delivery to Libya is not going to stop, not for the foreseeable future. I'm so, I'm sorry, whoever tries to say that, that is not really paying attention. But there has been one in this interesting note is that one of the ships, I believe it's the Assos, that was seized in towards the end of February by General Hafter's forces carrying arms was actually busted by the French Navy two weeks ago off Senegal. But this time, instead of carrying weapons, it was loaded with marijuana and hashish. This was this uh, this happened within ninety days after the UN intervened to get the ship released from Hafter's forces, and then ninety days later, it gets busted off West Africa carrying illegal drugs. So, trust me, you know. If there is some sort of point where what we've seen in parts of West Africa, you know, like some in like some of the routes, human beings are going north, and we're seeing cigarettes and weapons moving south. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned cigarettes because cigarettes are a specialty of Hezbollah, and while no one is really paying attention to that angle, a they reemerged in various parts of Africa. B there has been some Iranian interest in Libya, as I mentioned earlier, including weapons transports and, of course, drug trade in general. And see, you know, there is this collusion of diverse interests, even though people don't like to admit it. So, you you know, you and Meyer earlier discussed the point about Yemen, comparing Yemen and Libya. Funny that you mentioned that because we are seeing the exact same thing. You, we are seeing drug trade from Yemen aimed at Middle, attempted at Middle Eastern, at the Gulf states. Um, and and they, we are seeing the same types of smuggling of weapons from Somalia uh, and also from other routes uh, to the ports in Yemen. Uh, ships get intercepted, some of them do, and some of them still make it through despite a proliferation of foreign, of foreign naval, you know, contingents and uh, intelligence in the, in the region. And and we are also seeing an additional factor, which is the United Nations, which has in the past been busted 
actually helping Houthis uh, uh, store their weapons, some of them are illegally uh, brought into the country from outside in, in some of their facilities. So all of a sudden we're seeing UN intervening on behalf of a contraband ship, bringing in weapons illegally. And a couple of weeks later, they're bringing in a different type of contraband drugs that they used to fuel, you know, to fund and fuel these conflicts. So the question well, that's is- not the only thing, That's not the only thing, uh, Irina, you know, and there have been several places in Africa. I don't know if they've been actually accused of a cop doing it in Libya. But there have been, you know, several other places, notably the Congo and the Central African Republic, where we're seeing they've seen UN staffers actually get involved in the sex trade. That's an that's another factor. I mean, I haven't heard much coverage of in Libya. I would be wondering if what my thoughts about that, because if the UN has been doing it in other parts of Africa, and with the refugees moving through the country, it, it's going to be hard to believe that. We've seen people traffic through Libya, go to Italy, and end up in the sex trade and doing like that. I'd be, I'd be kind of surprised for that to not to actually be happening inside Libya itself. Maya? Yeah. I, I didn't hear the last words. Oh, uh, the question was about uh, given UN staffers' involvement in sex trafficking in other parts of Africa and given the number of refugees passing through Libya, is it is there a good likelihood that UN staffers could also be involved in facilitating or being involved in you know in in sex crimes and sex trafficking inside Libya? Well, this is a a, a complicated issue because you know the UN uh, and the international uh, funding programs inside the whole world, not all, not not only Africa, but in Africa there's no forces, there's no control. There's no administrations, but generally the the uh, financial aids is going for the managerial. Fifty percent of it is going for the managerial and the uh, administrative uh, uh, compiling management. So uh, compiling management. So it, it wouldn't be uh, a great solution because uh, you know the the inside of the states of Africa and specifically in Libya. They're having a problem with the, with uh, with the management and with ideas. You know, uh, when, when you have a country is just chopped off into two or three parties, it's very hard to any international funding because you know even the the last the last years, the sex trafficking and the problems there, because you know, it's it's like it's like. For example, the Islamic Republic of Iran, they can't let the UN or the international uh, organization to to do their job or to control that. And additional to addition to that, the UN um, and the international community and even the EU, when they go to uh, to Libya, they are they having a relationship with one party and the others not. So um, uh, so uh, if they are. Uh, for example, the GNA have some supported from the uh, UN and the EU. Uh, when they go there, they listen to their narrative, but the other narratives, zero. They don't listen to that. And simply as that, and you can say the easiest way and the perfect way to uh, 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 go against them, you know, after is, is with Libya and Wagner, as Scott says. Uh, you know, you can't say that naive narrative that Haftar is with Russia and the GNA is with Turkey, and this is very naive. You know, if you want to uh, talk about the real issue, the real issue is that from inside, there's there's a country is chopped off. Now, I've, I've heard a lot of analysis that uh, Libya is not going through one country anymore in the future. Uh, a lot of people say that it, it will be two states, not one state like Sudan, like, like what happened in Sudan, not in the same form, not in the same way, because the situation is different in Libya. But yeah, this is, I've heard a lot of analysis that Libya is not going through as a one state for the future, is going to the future for two states, because uh, it's really hard, as Scott says, that the uh, uh, West and South, 
is uh, somehow um, together and uh, in the north in uh, Tripoli there's a, a different state there's no uh, uh, one idea for one country no if you go there if you find a solution for the north the south would be very annoyed and yeah? the same in the west and you have a borders with um, like like uh, Egypt, a regional country, and you have a borders with Algeria and Tunisia, and you have a borders with South Africa, which is not not South Africa, the state. I mean the southern state of Africa, uh, beginning with with Chad and uh, and Mali and um, all the, those countries. So. Um, these issues, and as, as Scott says, the um, the arms, I guess, I guess, not not only in the near future. I guess for for ten years, the arms for five years, ten years, the arms won't be won't be solved. As simple as that. Because you're talking to a groups of tribes, and they have that chauvinism idea that we are better than them with ruling the country, because they're not working with the legal process or. Um, uh, let's say uh, working with the institute constitution or, or a legal process. There's nothing like that. You're talking with the tribes and militias. Um, uh, by the way, militias, there's two different between tribes militias and uh, religious militias. The religious militias is, uh, is having a regional uh, uh, region and loyalty, but the uh, tribes militias is internal and they don't care. They don't give a, a sh for, for, excuse me for this expression. They don't give a shit for the international community. They don't give a shit for for the forces of any country because they're working for their land, which is um, tribe land. That's the issue in in those countries because you're having a lot of parties and one party is with a tribes militias and you have a tribes for religious tribes and you have the governmental tribes which is having a loyalty to the Muslims Brotherhood in, in, in its form. So um, you're dealing with something, you know, um, it's, it's something very complex. If you want to solve it, uh, it's like at the end, you know, kill everybody and the king will live. <laughs> and the end, that's the, the, uh, the, the issue, it's very complicated. That's why if, you, if you're talking about sex suffering, uh, sex trafficking and uh, and uh, the arms and the even you know you have harassment with children you have rec recruitment for children and and militias and all that crimes are very awful but at the end um, if you went to those tribes or these militias and you said ah this is a children you know he won't even listen to you because his mentality is not going through a legal way. His mentality just for gaining money, and that's it. So we, to summarize, we have a few factors. We have the UN, the UN, the inter, so-called international community, which is potentially facilitating some of the very things it claims to be fighting: weapons smuggling, drugs smuggling, sex trafficking. If not directly, then at least to individuals. And children, by the way, children recruitment is a very highly. Uh, uh, very strange issue, you know. Nobody talks about uh, the children in Libya. You know, almost, let's say, 60% of the Turkish militias which has been sent from Syria, they are under 18. You know, if, if you're following the news, I'm following a lot of news, they are under 18 and they went to Libya and most of them are killed there. Child recruitment is very, very, uh, let's say, a bad issue. Nobody talks about it. It's you know? even less talked about than in Yemen. Much less, I would say, actually. Exactly, exactly. So we have all these factors. And then the same institutions that either ignore these issues completely or facilitate them, which is even worse, are attempting to run an election based on these factors, which seems to be doomed to failure. Who is going to be actually voting who are the administrators? You have tribes, you have you have Muslim Brotherhood, you have people playing game political games to, you know, uh, because uh, because the Biden administration is not reliable. So, what what, what is this political process in, supposed to actually <laughs> accomplish? It's not going to unify the country. It's not going to solve any of these territorial and uh, demographic disputes. It's not going to 
shut down uh, extremism. It's not going to get rid of the uh, militias and child recruitment. So what is this vote really about? This, this vote is actually going to show, I, in my opinion, this vote is actually meant to show that the United Nations is actually a still a relevant actor. You know, there have been several instances, you know, in recent years of several other missions where the UN has failed miserably. Yemen is a prime example about how they've been trying to get a consensus amongst the international community to address the hunger and the infant mortality and, you know, the class in the medical system along with the government. The U Yemen has been a failure for the United Nations. I will even go so as far as to say the situation in Syria has been a, is a failure of the United Nations to address that conflict. So, right, you know, and with the criticisms, you know, with the Trump administration actually suspended the U.S. from paying dues to the U.N., you know, because of some of these bad actions. So, basically, if they see a successful election in Libya... They can come back to the U. They can come to the United Nations. It's like, see, we actually have a success here, yeah, you know. And we would like to can make sure that the U.S. still continues to pay its pay its dues. I I've, I agree. That's a cynical view, but you know, cynicism runs well in the streets of Washington. And you know, and everybody wants to, you know, uh, everybody was critical of the. Uh, of the, the Trump administration's policy, but you look at one of the first statements that President Biden made is like, "American is back on the world stage, and we will be working with our partners." A in that view, and that if you take that view, a successful election in Libya is a necessary, it's almost mandatory for a successful election to actually further that point of view along, because if there's a failure in Libya. Everybody, you know, people can say, "Once here we go again, the UN and try to intervene in the country, try to bring people together, and they messed it up. I was wondering what you thought of that, Meyer. I agree with you. The UN have messed it up, and I, I, I told you, Arena and Scott, that there is a lot of, of uh, analysis on Libya that is not going to the future with one state. Because you know, um, uh, to conclude this this talk, I'm I'm, I'm very glad that I, I talked about the Libyan issue because it's mixed with uh, a lot of problems in the region, like the Muslims forces, either Shiite, uh, she has uh, uh, forces supported by Iran, Sunni forces supported by Turkey, and um, and uh, the problems of tribes which is uh, uh, the types now in the South, you know, if, if you want them to bring back uh, Qaddafi's son, they will do that. If they have some interest, they will do that. So they, they will have uh, their own country, as simple as that, you know? So uh, the UN has messed up that because they came to, uh, uh, let's say, unite the country, but they supported the, you know, the problem is, when you give a legitimacy to one party and the other parties not. So uh, this party would, by, by their legitimacy, for example, uh, a Siraj uh, government, they signed an agreement with, with Turkey, you know? 70%, 60% of the Libyan community, they are against this, uh, this agreement. Because you know, Libya, even the, the tribes, they have uh, problems with the Ottoman history more than Tunisia, more than Morocco, more than Egypt, even Egypt. Uh, uh, Libya, because they were uh, Italy colony, as you know. So uh, Libya, they think that, uh, that nobody can solve their problem. It's like as simple as that, it's, it's similar to Yemen. It's similar, very similar to Yemen because uh, uh, when you have an, an international will not to support the parties, because the problem won't be solved from outside. The solution can be coming from outside. And the UN has messed up, I totally agree with Scott, uh, messed up the UNITE issue in Libya. Um, so um, I guess all the election is not fair. It's a fraud talking about the election without 
solving the real problem, which is uh, uh, bringing up on the table the West forces, the South forces, and the government in the, on the table and uh, having this discussion. What do you want? What, what sort of constitution that can rule the country and what sort of formalization can rule in the Republic. But by having a forces from Russia and Turkey and uh, those forces supported this party, it won't be solved because now the international community become the problem, by the way, become the problem because the case fire succeeded inside Libya. So the international community became the problem, you know? So uh, I guess the interest should be uh, to bringing up all the parties on the table and uh, talking about the real issue, especially the gas one. You know, the last agreement for Sarraj with Turkey, uh, this wouldn't be go uh, with, with Egypt interest or Italy or Greece, Cyprus and uh, France. And uh, all the movement now uh, with Erdogan to calm down the issue because uh, there's a new administration which n not totally are, are going with Erdogan. So uh, he's trying to calm down with the allies, with the administration, not with the U.S. interest. And I guess the clearance of the U.S. should be, uh, should be going very good because the administration, now uh, the real issue with the administration, there's no clear in any in any case, you know, even internally in the U.S., if, if, if you see the internal U.S., there's no clearance about an issue. You know, even the 100 days, which Biden promises to be uh, in, in the same uh, in, in, in his uh, plan, it doesn't go as well. Not because of the Republicans, because the issues itself, which dealt by Biden, is very complex and it can't be uh, solved by a naive solution which can, uh, by the way, I mean, if, if you look to the uh, administration of Biden and the stream media before the, elect, the US presidential election, they were speaking that, you know, when we come to the office, everything would be solved. And we're like heading to the first six months and nothing, nothing solved. So we are not having the real discussion and the parties that are organizing these conferences and get togethers have vested in interest in exploiting the divisions, not in unifying the country. And the US, which is technically neutral, is not, you know, has no solutions and does not have an interest to get involved in doing what needs to be done. So who, what party do you see as a potential leader on having the real conversations and not these side conversations that they're actually about benefiting various uh, interested outside actors and not really solving these underlying concerns. And that's the question oh. to both of you. Ooh, such a great question because part of the problems that the U.S. has had regarding Libya, it even goes back to the Trump administration because, you know, everybody thought that Trump, you know, would be supporting Erdogan, but then, you know, he came out with statements supporting General Hafter, but then the State Department would actually walk, they would be walking those statements back. It's like, no, we do not, we don't support the GM, the, the you know, LNA in general after we don't support the GNA, you know, we support the process of ensuring because, you know, the, the State Department likes to be nuanced in its conversations, but actually there is one, one, one country I would actually like to see stand up and actually own up to it. You know, besides having Russia at the talks, which I agree with Meyer, they should be there. You know, you generally don't hear enough about Italy having a presence at the talks, considering people forget they are the former colonial power. You know, even though they actually took the country away from the Ottomans back in 1911 and they, you know, and they actually gained its independence. But you don't generally hear people say, what do the Italians think about this, you know? Because, you know, even though they're the former colonial power, you know, they were independent for a certain amount of time, well, they still have some 
you know, they still have some ownership issues. I mean, look what, the, look at how Germany's being treated over Namibia over actions committed before the First World War. Look at how, look at how France gets treated for its intervent, how it intervenes in its former colonials whenever there's a major crisis. I mean, we've seen, you know, Mali, Gabon, the, you know, Brazzaville to an extent, other Central African Republic. You know, you know, why doesn't Italy get held to that same standard? You know, that's one question you, you know, and situation you don't hear enough of. But, you know, um, and, you know, you like to see everybody talks about, you know, Tunisia, Algeria, you know, and Morocco. But you don't hear about the other, some of the other states, you know, like, Mar like Mauritania, you know. They have a little bit of skin in this, you know, Niger, Burkina, Mali. Now we're starting to see jihadist activities now in northern Cote d'Ivoire. Does Cote should Cote d'Ivoire be there saying, hey, look, you knuckleheads, your inability to uh, restore order, now it's affecting us. I mean, some countries are limitless, you know. Why is it the AU involved? I mean, the African Union, generally, they... Because uh, in some of my other work, I have been critical about their lack of interest in Cameroon. So it's like, is this another case where I can actually land base the African Union or the Arab League or even the Organization of the Islamic Conference? You know, those these organizations, they've been generally silent on Libya, too. So there are, very, there are some voices that are too loud that need to be, that need to just step back and let other voices step forward and but there are some people who generally who appear to have a role to play in this that are silent and need to step up so mm -hmm. but it's a delicate balance and as Meyer said um such as such as international politics these days hmm. very interesting point Meyer, do you have anything to add to that um, your question is very important. Uh, if you want to talk about the issue of Libya, now um, Italy, as, as I mentioned, and Scott uh, uh, told that Italy should be there in the conversation. And um, if we, we speak generally, you know, the uh, uh, issue, for example, India, you know, India is one of the countries in gas, is sharing holders in gas, and India. Uh, uh, is sharing with, uh, the same region with Iran and sharing the same region with Pakistan and they do uh, uh, dealt with the uh, Islamic forces. So um, if you have those experience, you would have a, a, a good intentions and solution, you know, involving uh, some countries, you know, like Algeria and Morocco and Tunisia and they have internal problems uh, and in the same region, and they will having uh, this this problem with, with Libya itself, with some parties, you won't solve it, you know. And uh, the UN has messed up because uh, when, when you reach a wall, you have no solution either to go back and rearrange things or just stop for that. That's the main vision. And to conclude that Libya, uh, as they told you, you have to bring out all the parties on the table and speak about the real issue. But uh, giving like medicines just for uh, uh, calming the pain is not the solution because every time would have the, the same problem and the same military problem. And is there a credible party that's not, for instance, the UN that you see as hiding? that sort of starting that sort of conversation i guess uh i guess uh uh, uh there's there's nothing hidden because all the hidden parties are, are uh, uh, going through the media you know and uh, uh become become clear that they have the real issue in libya you know you have parties and as i told you uh, the real parties are on the media stream, but uh, they are like uh, 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 generating a new names, just a new names, but the same the same problem. Mm -hmm. So right now we are kind of at an impasse with no real leadership and just 
everyone pursuing their side interest in this matter without really going to confront the elephant in the room, so to speak. Exactly, Mali. I guess I guess if the if the election if the next election, which me and Scott uh, agreeing that uh, uh, it, it's a fraud to be the perfect solution. But if the next election uh, want, uh, let's say, um, uh, representing the whole Libyan tribes and the whole Libyan uh, people, uh, it will lead the country to a two-state solution, not one state as a Libya. Mm -hmm. Well, on that less than cheerful note, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, this has been a very, very insightful and thought-provoking discussion. After the conference, while I don't expect these issues to even begin to change, there will be somewhat different factors to consider in terms of managing these issues and in terms of preventing further disintegration of local security. That is something to be managed alongside trying to figure out a way to get everyone on the same page and to get past those who are not interested in getting everyone on the same page for their own reasons. And um, we will continue having these discussions because I, I, I'm not seeing anyone else actually really do that. I'm seeing there's been a lot of lobbying and there's been a lot of back and forth, but there hasn't been a lot of real substantive discussion of what's going on, nor any sort of real follow through to kind of avoid seeing what happens, how it will affect other parts of the region. And on the one hand, as, as, you, as you said, Africa is becoming increasingly more important. On the other hand, it's facing more issues than, than even before. And some of the issues that are outside of Africa becoming globalized. We've heard Erdogan import groups, Muslim Brotherhood affiliates from Yemen to Libya. We do know that some of the groups from Yemen want to go to Yemen, uh, from Libya or from Syria want to go to Yemen next themselves. So we are seeing a globalization of security problems that's disconcerting and regardless of you know good faith interest of various parties they were following what thinking about and i'm hoping to do more events on the subject in the future thank you so much thank you uh thank scott you. uh both of you lent incredible insights to this discussion and i hope to see you both in many many conversations soon that's a pleasure actually thank you reno it's my pleasure thank you so much Myra, it's a pleasure Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you so much, my brother. Thank you.